First, we will hear from Mr. Peter Hirschberg, who is uh, a Silicon Valley insider and startup veteran who is currently the senior fellow at the Annenberg Center for Communications, Leadership, and Policy. Uh, Mr. Hirschberg serves as an advisor to the MIT Sensible Cities Lab and formerly headed uh, Apple's Enterprise Marketing Division. Just after, and thank you, Peter, for joining us up at the stage. Just after, Peter, we'll hear from Dr. Andreas uh, Wiegand, who directs the Social Data Lab and teaches at Stanford University. He was the chief scientist at Amazon, where he studied what the company can learn from its customers. Uh, he now advises global corporations on how to take advantage of today's changing business environment. It's this that I think we can also take, that we need to learn better from our customers what they need. And I think one of the, the exciting parts of the, uh, of the Global Pulse is that we can get much closer to our customers, to the people, the poorest and most vulnerable people around the world and what they need. So without further ado, if I could turn it over to Peter and to Andreas. Thank, Thank you, you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Orr, excellencies and honored guests, it is a hallmark of today's digital world that mankind generates vast amounts of data everywhere and all the time. And, and these are really signals that have the potential for unprecedented insight into behavior, into economics, and into our health and well-being. On this day, there will be as many searches on the internet as people on Earth. And each of those creates a signal of our intention and interest. Over a billion times a day when we publish on a blog or a social network, we're signaling our opinions, our sentiments, and we send clues that social scientists could not have dreamed of a decade ago. Also today, there will be more than 300 million credit card transactions, and each of those is an economic signal. In fact, the most prolific signaling device on Earth is probably the mobile phone. There are five billion of them, and four billion of those are in developing nations. We humans send about 10 billion text messages a day. And every mobile phone sends a signal, a location signal, that paints a picture about how people move, how cities grow, economic activity, and the quality of life. In 2011, we will generate more data than mankind has since the beginning of history. And properly analyzed, these signals can help us detect an economic crisis in its very early stages, or see the outset of an epidemic before it becomes an epidemic. That's why mankind's data is really a core resource, which is at once inexhaustible and pervasive. But Peter, with all these numbers, it's not only pervasive. We live in the day when the world got connected. So this global world allows us to look at patterns both like through a microscope and through a telescope. This is an irreversible step in human progress. So if we look at the creation and the distribution of data, we can really say data is the new oil. Just like oil, to create value out of it, it needs to be refined. Just like oil, there's an ecosystem spring up around it. But unlike oil, data does not get used up. We don't have to worry that we run out of data. I would like to make a distinction. There are actually two kinds of data. There are social data, data people create and share, and there are observed transactional data. So for those data that people create and share, we really live in a revolution. It has become trivially easy for pretty much anybody in the world to express anything they want, where they are, what they think, and to distribute it to their friends, say, on Facebook, and to the world on Twitter. A good example for such social data would be people's geolocation. Or it would be people share how they feel about something. So that is what we call social data. The other kind of data, transactional data, observed data, or objective data. Examples range from the levels of the floods in Thailand today to credit card transactions, international money flows, or the phone calls you make. So speaking of phone calls, here is an example of what it actually looks like 
when we observe massive human behavior all at the same time. Take a look at the video. That's Rome in the year 2006, and it's the World Cup Finals between Italy and France. Now, MIT and Telecom Italia have anonymously mapped text messages and calls from Rome that day during the tournament. It's the first time we get to watch human behavior at scale in real time through phone calls. So, it's the end of normal time. The first 15-minute overtime happens. There's a second 15-minute overtime. Zidane gets the red carpet and then Italy goes crazy. You can see the digital signal spike and the World Cup match ends. And what you see is that when you marry cell phone data and location data and cities, you get a real-time sense for human behavior and how it changes over time. And that's something to go to work with. But it's not only about sports. Let's talk about the economics of data. So the marginal cost of creating this data, of using this data, these affluent data as we call them, is zero. In our lifetime, we have moved from a data-poor environment to a data-rich environment. That means we have created an ecosystem where people can create value from this data. Why do we care? It's about making decisions. Let me give you a very simple example. Traffic. We now have real-time traffic data. We know how long it takes to get home from here. So you can make better decisions based on those real-time traffic data. Cities can be run more effectively based on real-time traffic data. So I, through the back door, introduced the notion of real-time here. In the past, many decisions were made very complicated because the timescales of reporting data, the timescales of observing data, were much slower than the timescales of the underlying processes. We are no longer limited by the timescale of observing and reporting data. We now can see the world in real time. The important thing about this is that this allows for experimentation. I'm a physicist. Last century was the century of physical sciences, where physicists did experiments and measured the outcome. This century, is the century of social sciences, where we can run experiments in the real world. And having instrumented the world can measure the outcome. And this is what a measurement like that might look in New York. Here's another visualization. And what you're looking at are all of the telephone connections from New York to the rest of the world. Now, they paint this vivid picture of connections, of a global pulse. But what's interesting is when we go underneath and we start looking at the relationships. You dig a little deeper, and there's data about commerce flows, about emigration, about how families maintain relationships. It turns out the number one place New Yorkers call is the Dominican Republic, not London or a global business hub. It turns out when the cost of a call to the Dominican Republic for an hour uh, is less than the cost of a subway trip, the economics change our behavior, and in fact, internationally change their behavior. So often, we assume that technology is for wealthy nations. But really, if you look at where it can make the biggest difference and where it's growing the fastest, it's in developing countries. And this kind of exhaust cell phone data can also serve at times when we need it most. In the aftermath of the Haitian earthquake, it was an analysis of cell phone data that showed where the population had dispersed to, which was vital to relief workers. And then, when there was a cholera outbreak some months later, these techniques were used so well that within 12 hours, Researchers from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden took that data and they knew where in the country people who had cholera and were in those locations were dispersing to, and then they could identify what areas might likely get an outbreak next. So that kind of activity is immensely useful, and it goes on everywhere. The United Nations has already cited Africa as having the greatest rate of mobile phone growth in the world. And it's also where some of the most exciting work is going on to understand these signals and shed light on economic development. Dr. Nathan Eagle and his associates from Harvard and MIT have analyzed millions of phone records, all anonymously, in Kenda and Rwanda. And they've compared them to survey data. What they learned is the pattern that a person uses to purchase mobile time, how we top up and in what denominations we do so, has proven to be a remarkable surrogate, an indicator for the economic health of a population. It turns out that people who top up in lots of small increments are generally 
not as well off economically as someone who spends the same amount but can afford to do so all at once. So by gathering only essentially effluent cell phone data, it's possible to see village by village, city by city, how an economy is doing. So that an economist in the DRC or Indonesia can measure the effect of an intervention or perhaps go ahead and recommend a new one in real time. So let's actually see how we have changed based on the prevalence of social data. I want to give you three examples how social data have transformed industries. The first one is Amazon.com. People make decisions differently now. They make decisions based on what other people say. Think about reviews for books. Second one is Facebook. People consume news in different ways from before based on what their friends recommend to them, what Facebook curates for them. And thirdly, Google. Google has changed the way how we relate to information. And not only how we relate to information, but also how we create information, how we create knowledge. For instance, in Google Maps, any one of you has the ability to change or to annotate something. That is bringing power to the people. And it turns out that same power, again, is remarkably powerful in developing countries and in times of crises. Uh, after the Haiti earthquake, it was data from hundreds of individuals that literally rebuilt the map of that country. Every flash that you see here represents an edit to the OpenStreetMap project as people were adding street information. First, primary and secondary roads in red and green. Then you can see smaller residential streets added. And then in the blue glowing area, those are the camps of displaced people during the emergency. People sharing data, working together. And this happens not just in emergencies. Anybody can contribute to the knowledge of the world by fixing or annotating something. And this kind of energy, this bottoms up citizen energy to go build stuff, we see in San Francisco or Singapore or even in Kibera. Because there, people mapped out that community near Nairobi and then started adding information to it with timely information so there could be a basis of sharing. And that act of engagement itself built community. Community is important. Sharing is important. Now, I believe that all of those data people share can create an extremely powerful early warning system. Health officials often need to make decisions under pressure and minimal data. Let me give you a recent example from my country, from Germany. You might have heard about this E. coli outbreak a couple of months ago. And I want to show you a visualization produced by the company Epidemic IQ. They use data both from news sources, but also from thousands of blogs. What you see there is that in the north of Germany, with a relatively high granularity, they figure out where the outbreaks are. At the bottom of this graph, the red curve is what the official health agencies thought. The green curve is what they managed to gather from blogs and from other news sources. What you see is one, the communal data is more timely, and two, it is much more high granularity than you could get with the delays and the low granularity of official reporting. So here is what Epidemic IQ's Rob Munro told us. We have found that in about 95% of cases, the very first indication that there is an outbreak somewhere is in natural language. It's in a report which is on the web. So with a recent outbreak of Ebola in Uganda, uh, we're tracking it a little earlier than a number of other health organizations, but more importantly, we're able to pull in much richer data from a large number of sources. So we knew not just how many people were infected, but what kind of transport they took when they went from their village to the hospital in the nearest main town. So we have invented something extremely powerful. As with anything powerful, it is not black or white. It is our responsibility to communicate trade-offs, to communicate to trade-offs so we can use those tools responsibly and preserve people's rights. There is a public good nature to it, and you only get to use the advantages which we created here if people actually share their data. Excellencies, 
Everything we've talked about today can only be achieved if people actually share, if people socialize the data. You know, Andreas, sometimes we get jaded by the pace of technology development or any big numbers, but these signals really constitute one of the fastest growing phenomena on Earth today. To give you a sense for the scale of that, in 1995, there were about 50 million web users. Think of that as the size of the moon. Today, we've just passed through 4.3 billion web addresses used. Compared to the moon, that's about the size of the Earth. And in 15 years, much of our built world and our things, there should be about a trillion connected devices out there, all emitting signals, telling stories, helping us engineer a better world. That would be the size of Jupiter. So great is the production of this data that many are calling it a revolution equal in import to the Industrial Revolution, which is why the work that you're doing at the United Nations in this area is so timely and important. You're really bringing together two cultures, the tools and systems to capture and analyze these signals at scale, and the human insights, the response mechanisms, and the government processes that will lead to better decisions. It really is not an understatement to say that this is the century and this is the moment when connection happened on Earth. And your body is really providing the leadership in learning how to apply these in crisis identification to development and to help. help. You know, Excellencies, as an observer from the private sector and from Silicon Valley, where we often imagine what our technologies might do, this is a moment of great hope and expectation as we watch the United Nations share with its many member states these new capabilities for all mankind. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andreas.